Kira Koto, I'm James and I lead the circular economy work at the Sustainable Business Network. And what I want to talk to you about today is how we work to transform the refurbishment sector from a linear to a circular sector by designing out waste. And we worked uh, with Studio Pacific Architecture to uh, enable them in their office refurbishment in Wellington to achieve a 64% uh, reuse and um, a, a reuse rate. So we're not talking about 64% recycling, we're talking about 64% uh, reuse and redistribution. And the way we did that was we took a systems innovation approach and we got key stakeholders from the system, uh, designers, uh, specifiers, um, product suppliers, and also uh, the likes of the, the council who have to sign things off. And we looked at what is, what's the system? What are the, what's going wrong? What are the intervention points and leverage points where we can actually make a difference? And to cut a very long story short, it sort of boils down to, and this is a direct quote from uh, one of the people involved, that um, this is not Studio Pacific Architecture, of course, but architects like to have empty places that they can fill with shiny new stuff. So that's a basically the insight we need to work on. And so how can we embed circular economy principles in terms of um, this process before the designers get hold of this? Uh, get hold of the project. And so what we developed was you know, a very, very simple process, which is very similar to a standard process, but the only real difference is this stage one, where we um, provide the uh, resources to be able to catalogue what's in situ before you know, a new talent comes in, and analyse that in terms of what can be reused or redistributed. And um, that is effectively how we work to hack the system uh, that, was, that was happening. And so that is the uh, re revitalized, new refurbished uh, office from uh, in Studio Pacific Architecture in Wellington. And they have used the, they continue to use uh, circular economy model office for their um, Auckland office, which they just recently moved down from around here, I don't exactly know where they were actually, but into uh, High Street in, uh, in Auckland CBD. So um, it's, um, it's a very simple process that along with the, um, the matrices and assistance and downloads, and it, it's, um, it's something that uh, has made a real difference. So if you're interested in that sort of approach, um, yeah, we'd love to speak to you and uh, you speak to me or my colleague Tori, who is uh, leading our advisory work. Kia ora. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Nick Morrison from um, Go Well Consulting, and I'm going to take a few of my um, five minutes just to say thank you very much for organising this. I think it's fantastic. Sometimes I think we can all feel a little bit isolated in our consultancies doing this work, and it's so fantastic to have all you um, like-minded people here. Um, and really, I just want to start by saying it is a, a matter of um, you know us shifting to an economic system that operates in harmony with the real world, right? Everything in the real world, every natural system is circular, so we have to move to a circular economic system, it's really that simple, it's just about how fast uh, we do that. Um, I'm going to talk to you about Emma Lewisham, who a uh, um, beauty brand, um, do like very expensive <laughs> um, ageing cream and um, beauty creams, I don't use them myself, but um, my partner loved getting a few free um, samples. Um, and so just a few points to talk through here really, trying to do this in five minutes is not easy James. Um, so I think it really starts by gaining a deep understanding, um, and they did that. They'd already done quite a bit of work before we started with them, and they looked deeply into the industry, and especially packaging is a really big challenge for that industry. Um, basically, anything and everything can be recycled, right, but it's all about the economics of it. And packaging can be really complex to um, 
and expensive to, to recycle because of all the different components in it. And, and beauty packaging is often very, or the design brief to, to the packaging people is to make it look beautiful, make it take up shelf space, make it like easy to, um, to squirt or whatever. Um, and so it's not about making it fit into the recycling system, right? So it comes with lots of different types of plastics and coloured plastics and coloured glasses and there's small pieces and big pieces and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so although it's technically recyclable and I'll often say that it's recyclable, it is not getting recycled, right, because of the recycling system. So they did that, they understood that deep, that, um, sort of did that deep understanding. Um, they, they, they stuck to their values, that, that is what they were about. It's, I don't know for those other consultants out there, but we love working with the startup businesses who come in to disrupt, right? So much harder turning a big ship versus a small startup. But they came in wanting to disrupt the, the industry and, and they're doing that. Um, and so I think it's really important that you stick to that because it is hard, it is really, really challenging to implement these circular um, systems. Um, they then design, as we've talked about already, it's about designing for that system, right? And so they understood that about their packaging and the whole recycling side of things, and so they designed packaging that could be sent back to them and sterilised and refilled, okay? And they worked with uh, Toitu to map their uh, carbon footprint to a product level, and they found that between the seven products at the time, it was between a 57 and 74% reduction in their carbon emissions if you chose to buy their refill option rather than their full package op option, right? Making sense? And just reminding you all, of course, that our global goal is to half our emissions by 2030, right? And there's a business that designed and, and has, has achieved it. Um, the big challenge is then getting their customers to buy into it and change their behaviours, right? Um, so that's, I'm skipping one here, but going to that communicate with confidence and competence while authentic and transparent, something we say all the time, well that's a mouthful. So they, that, that's what they're really having to work on now, is get their customers to stop putting it in their recycling bin, even though they think they might be doing the right thing. Try and incentivise, educate, engage them to actually send it back to them. And I was talking to a, another client who had ordered some of the stuff, and the classic story, you know, she'd used it and kept it in the box, because they only take four pods back at a time and her husband and found it and cleared it out, what's this doing here in the, in the cupboard, right? So these kind of real world challenges around behaviour change that they are having to work on. And look, we won't really know how successful it is, probably for another six, 12 months until you start getting all those pods coming back, because they've set up um, very, very mindful of their mission. So they've set up um, a three power system in Australia, UK, and I think they've done the one in, in North America, or they're trying to anyway, so that they can collate the pods and then ship them back rather than sending them back one at a time. All right? So we don't really know the full success for a while yet. But they're having great success in terms of people choosing to select the pods in terms of buying on, online. They're sending them a, a free return sticker, etc., etc. So, um, yeah, that's a pretty critical part, right? So you can design the best system in the world, but if people don't engage in it and don't sort of um, follow it, it, it doesn't really work. Um, Going back just to that share your knowledge and learnings, they, I don't know who followed their, their sort of global launch, but they shared their IP, they put it out to the whole industry because this is really hard to do on their own. We've been talking a lot about collaboration. If the whole industry shifted to this kind of model, it would make things so much easier for everyone. So that was a really critical part as well. And frustratingly, for, from my point of view anyway, not enough of their kind of competitors, industry peers, try and soften that language, mm -hmm. have taken it up, all right, and, and, and invested it themselves, especially some of these massive organisations that, you know, profit in the billions and still sticking with this, oh, it's recyclable, it's recyclable, knowing that it's not. So that's, I don't know, they're doing what they can, but it's not really getting taken up as much as I'd like to. Is that me finishing or a warning? Okay, oh, that's me finishing. Um, I think I've talked all that, just a picture of the packaging. So this is the um, pod system, um, and um, the one on the, on the left, that is a material they can't put in a pod due to... The, I don't know, understand it to be honest, but the, I think it damages the quality of the, of the product basically. So they've had to put it into these reusable pouches, not reusable, these pouches that they can still send back and send away to get recycled. Cool. Kia ora koutou. Um, I'm going to start with an apology, which is something you're not supposed to do when you're speaking, but um, I'm stepping in for my colleague Mark Hilton, who's our Head of Sustainable Business, and unfortunately he couldn't be here today, so he's got my notes, um, and I'm going to hopefully take you through it. Um, hopefully, nonetheless, you find it interesting. Um, in our sustainable, uh, the work we do around our sustainable business, um, we work with businesses um, to understand the impact of their products and services and develop new business models uh, and assess the benefit, benefit of these. And we work right through the, right through the process from um, sustainability strategies, regulatory analysis, 
cost benefit analysis, carbon footprinting through to the implementation side of things. And so for the case study today um, that I wanted to take you through, I'm just going to take you through uh, s some work we did in the UK uh, back in 2020 uh, through to 2022, um, working with a manufacturer of um, an industrial washer. And the concept was to eco-design um, one of their popular products and move it from uh, and move it to a, a lease take-back model um, and business and, and remanufacture model as well. Um, so we worked with the company on both the financial viability uh, and on the carbon um, uh, benefits uh, to build a business case for for the new um, the new uh, way of delivering the product. So the new product's lighter. Um, it's, it's, it's completely modular um, for simpler repair and remanufacture and it's obviously off offered under that lease model. Um, and that lease model enables optimised servicing and condition monitoring so that you can actually um, understand where, that, where the, the, um, the item is, is at in terms of its service life um, and allow for take back uh, at, the, at the end of the contract to, to, for remanufacture. So in terms of the, uh, the benefits, um, that lease arrangement is, is actually good for the, the company because it's allowed them to sort of lock in customers by offering uh, long-term um, arrangement at a very, uh, for a very reliable system at a predictable uh, cost. It, everyone today these days is thinking about um, uh, supply chains and su supply chain um, uh, sustainability and supply chain uh, reliability. And one of the things that's, um, that's actually benefits of this which I quite like is that it's um, it's enabled uh, them to through taking that product back in at the end of um, at, through through it, when it's being repaired at the end of its life it gives them additional products that they can actually um, have in their supply chain so quite like the idea that rather than what your waste being something that you get rid of it's actually a, it's actually adding to your supply chain security um, and our analysis showed that uh, over the 25 year period um, the new, the new model would result in a 55% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions compared to the previous model and three tonnes less waste, which is basically the, the unit would have to be replaced roughly on average twice over that 25-year period. Um, next slide. Um, and those, those benefits came about um, mainly in the following way. So through light weighting, um, of materials, so but basically still using very durable materials, and um, that accounted for about 25% of the um, of the the benefit. Um, and uh, the modular um, the modular design um, of the steel cabinet means that each panel can be replaced um, rather than the whole unit having to be uh, to be thrown out. Um, and additionally, that, that modular design uses, uh, allows for greenhouse gas emission savings by using refurbished motors and, and water pumps rather than uh, new components, so they can swap old uh, refurbished ones back in. Um, so that lease model um, or product as a service um, reduces unnecessary uh, servicing journeys uh, and ensures an even higher quality of maintenance and repair over time, uh, which increases the, um, the life of the product and um, improves the reuse and recycling rates of materials at the end of their life. So that is, um, that's me, right. done in less than five minutes. Um, I have notes because I will go off piste, so I'll just stick with my notes if that's okay. Um, so what I'm talking to you about today is uh, product stewardship, and product stewardship is an effective tool um, that we have in our arsenal when we're talking about circular economy. So, does that fit on there? Cool. Um, so a well-designed product stewardship scheme looks to address not only the market failure for a product, uh, end-of-life product, uh, but also looking beyond the lowest value solution outcomes to a more sustainable, long-term, innovation-driven, demand-led market for that material. Um, so how does product stewardship enable innovation to happen with end-of-life tyres, a product which is a, uh, a probable you know, waste stream has a, a negative environmental outcome? Cool. Um, with no product stewardship scheme for end-of-life tyres, end markets do and did exist, but there was very little connection through that supply chain. So uh, you couldn't enable scale or high value to be achieved because there was scarcity of supply for that for that raw material um, and that feedstock. So and also much um, susceptibility to offshore markets if you were exporting, your value price was 
deemed by another market somewhere else. So not enough onshore um, stability. And basically that just becomes a race to the bottom where everyone is just trying to go to the lowest common denominator, which drops all the value out of that end of life product. Um, so recognizing this as a failure, the stakeholder designed product stewardship scheme called Tirewise has placed the value in the design for the scheme and the value of the end of life tires. So recognizing that they have inherent value in their makeup. Um, so knowing that there will be stability in the market for end of life tires because of that regulated product stewardship scheme, um, organizations are able to invest in those higher value out outcomes for those products. So there's three examples here where uh, matting and horse arena and um, earthquake strengthening uh, are good applications of a high value outcome for an end of life product. And all that takes is some stability in that supply chain and those end markets to become available. So. Cool, sorry, this is a little bit technical, some of it, but I'm getting through it. So the model that we designed in this product stewardship scheme is called the demand pull through model. And what that means is you, um, you do not get paid until the product has moved from one piece of that supply chain to the next piece of that supply chain. That avoids any stockpiling, which is the, the main market failure, is that you've clicked the money up front and then you don't pass it on to anybody, so you just bank the money. That's typically what end of life um, failure looks like. Um, so this model incentivizes and makes payments for each of those supply chain aspects. That gives some stability and some certainty for those processes and manufacturers, as well as for the consumer and at the retail end. So one of the main drivers for that is you've passed that cost all the way through and you're actually maintaining, holding or elevating the value of that product as it goes through that supply chain. Um, and the design of the product stewardship scheme enables that to, ha to happen because you can add incentives as you go, aiming for that higher value outcome for the material. Um, and naturally, Several companies have decided that they know that that regulated product stewardship scheme is going to be in, in place, so they have positioned themselves to be in all of all or some of those parts of that supply chain to guarantee that they get that feedstock for those products and security for that market. Um, and at the moment, we are developing the software which supports all of this, so that's really with each, each of the groups there, so the importers and retailers, transport operators, processors, etc. And we're doing that as a trial, so we were doing that in the Hawke's Bay, and that was around getting the interface right so that it's usable and it actually works in the real world when you've, when you've finished it and a truck driver can actually operate the buttons. Uh, and that was one of the first changes we made is bigger buttons for truck drivers who have massive thumbs so they can actually smash the screen with their thumbs. So um, all of that feedback's actually really useful because that's how you test and refine and build something, right? So, so yeah, so that, that system is actually set up so... The two key tenants for the design of the scheme are to enable mass balance so you can see where all that material is gone, so you know how successful you're being, and then you can address the areas that are weak, potentially, and also to, to show you where you need to make payments and where you need to incentivise. So it's a two-stage system of, of validation, so at each one of those checks, so a retailer and a transport operator, they will verify their load, and then that signals the transfer of the mass balance, but also the payments. So quite, quite straightforward, but um, pretty robust as well. And at the back end, you can get all the information around value, uh, feeds directly, MFE have a portal in the back so they can see where all the data is, right region. So yeah, it's a good system. Um, <laughs> Well-designed product stewardship means that you can actually add value to those waste streams rather than just you know, being it's a straight recycling component or something. So cool. Nice. Thank you. Kia Kotu ko Kalinda Ro Toku Ingoa. I'm the Sustainability Development Manager at All Heart NZ. We are a profit for purpose organisation that works with corporates and organisations to provide practical ways for reducing their waste. Um, I'm going to talk about a case study today, a project that we did with Auckland Transport. So they approached us back in 2021 to ask if we could help them with a solution for their used bus driver uniforms. Um, so we did a little research project around that and tried to work our way down the waste hierarchy. Uh, we proposed a solution, two solutions really. So one was a reuse option. So some of the uniform pieces, such as the jackets, were still in a really good condition. 
the uniform supplier, De Vere, sorts the uniforms when they come back. So the jackets that are still in a good condition go to a partner of ours who unstitch the little logo off them. The jackets then come back to All Heart and we either give those away to community um, partners or sell them through our network of stores around the country. Um, the jackets that, or the, sorry, the other uniform pieces that come back that aren't in a good condition and can't really be reused go to another partner of ours, Apparel, who do textile recycling. So they shred the uniforms, uh, the textiles down and then these are turned into a soft fibre that's used for cushion stuffing and upholstery, sound insulation and the likes. So the other piece of advice we gave and that was really taken up really proactively by De Vere was to redesign the logo because as the, the logos that we were unstitching were embroidered directly onto the jacket and as anyone knows who's tried to unstitch those at home, <laughs> they take quite a bit of time and effort to remove but also you've always, always got a little bit of a mark left on the item. So what De Vere did is they actually designed a little silicon uh, logo or that could be stitched onto the jackets a lot more easily and a lot easier to remove and don't leave a mark. So that's why I really love telling the story because not only did we sort of get a circular solution to make sure that the uniforms weren't going into landfill anymore but could be reused or recycled, we actually went back and redesigned the logo to make them easier to reuse. And um, at all hearts of the impact we have in our communities, the social impact is really, really important to us. Um, and we've been doing this for about a year now and the impact so far is that we've reused around 450 jackets that otherwise would have ended up in a landfill. Last winter in Northland we gave around 300 away to um, school children. So they were set up in our store in Kaikoui ready for sale and we had a couple of school principals come in and say wow we've got kids at schools that really need these jackets for the winter and we just gave them all away. We've also so far um, down, recycled around 1,300 kilograms of textiles um, and like I say we've supported communities in need and it provides employment so it's, that impact will increase as this is an ongoing initiative so that will continue to grow. Thank you. So my name's Barbara, I'm looking after ThinkStep and I will talk about a case study where we've leveraged a life cycle assessment study to help the organisation address waste in their supply chain. So strictly speaking, it's not really a circular economy project because yes, it's about reducing waste, it takes a life cycle approach but I have to admit, it makes, strictly speaking, from a circular economy point of view, makes a linear system a lot more effective and reduces waste. When we think circular economy, it is really about extending the life cycle of something, of a product, and retaining the value. But we feel that looking at the full life cycle is the start for any circular economy project as well. I also have not put it on the slides, but I do want to talk about SDGs for a little bit. So off the top of your head, which SDG is the one for circular economy? 12. And another one, <laughs> which I think is almost more important. Because when we look at this whole life cycle, we touch a lot of different players in that life cycle. So what we want to do is to really avoid any trade-offs between any stages. But we want to also disrupt that life cycle a little bit and have less resources coming in and less waste coming out. So that is the aspect where we did our life cycle assessment study identified what are all the materials flows, where does all the carbon sit along those material flows, because if we have a more circular economy, we can also reduce carbon emissions and not just reduce waste. There are a number of things we can actually do. 
And we came to this project from identifying the environmental impacts and then leveraged off into circular economy. And the good thing is there were standardized methodologies behind it. But what we then did with them was to actually unpack that life cycle and identify where are those intervention points in that full life cycle of, in this case, producing plasterboard. So that is our case study. And it's, there was a lot in the manufacturing, but so we can reduce energy during the manufacturing use, we can use recycled material back into the manufacturing. I'll tell that story at another time. We can, within the manufacturing process, bring waste back in, cutoffs. But then we have the sales process. And that's a key aspect to cut down. Because if we get the people who do the developments to actually measure out how much they need, the plasterwood company, Winston Warboards, will go, okay, well, for a certain size of the order, we'll give you this plasterboard cut to order. And that means there is no construction waste on site. And if it isn't on site, it means we keep it in the factory, which means we can put it back into plasterboard. So there is, we can have an intervention point in the manufacturing at the point of sales, but then also at entering contracts with the developers. Because if the developer actually puts some of those requirements into the contracts, that will feed back to the manufacturing. There is lots of collaboration going on. And then, of course, on the building site itself, there will be some cutoffs. And again, we'll have to have collaboration going on the building site to make sure that it finds the right place and doesn't end up on the landfill. So if I talk about all those different people involved and the collaboration along the supply chain, I actually think it's almost SDG 17, which is the key to circular economy, because it needs everyone in that supply chain to collaborate. So yes, SDG 12, but SDG 17, I think, is the key to it. And then we can actually find that sweet spot between circular economy and reducing carbon. Wow. <laughs> Kia ora koutou, um, ko Katie Tokawingwa from Plastics New Zealand, and we run Circular Connect. So, Circular Connect isn't a consultancy, um, it's a co funding opportunity for plastic waste minimization projects. So, what we do is fund phase one and phase two projects, which are so phase one would be discovering what opportunities are out there for minimizing plastic waste, and phase two would be looking at the uh, feasibility and development of those projects. Phase three, which is implementation, we don't co fund, so we're just focused on the first two. Um, the scope of that is quite broad. We've had everything from packaging all the way through to uh, construction and um, actually manufacturing plastics. So where can waste be minimized across the whole supply chain um, or across all industry, I suppose. Um, if you'd like more information, you can contact myself, but I'll move on to our case study. So we chose to talk about um, IP Plastics, and they are a manufacturer of large polypropylene or PP plastic products. So things like um, the clamshell paddling pools, big bins, uh, garden equipment. And what they identified was that there is a lot of plastics in those products, and typically at end of life, if they're broken, contaminated, they uh, will often just be disposed of instead of being properly washed and recycled. And so there's a lot of value in those products that they wanted to seize on and also minimize the plastic waste. So we started with a phase one project, um, and that was they were working with Square One Consulting, um, and they wanted to identify whether they could reuse um, or recover oversized uh, PP plastic products to reuse in their own process. Um, and also they, were, they did a bit of investigating into whether there was um, a biodegradable material that they could use for their plant pots instead. Um, that research is still ongoing, but the project that they chose to take through to phase two was that collection of the oversized PP products. So since August last year, they've been working with um, 
the word has suddenly lost my mind. Uh, uh, community recycling centres. I was thinking CRCs, but what does that stand for? Uh, they've been working with CRCs in Auckland um, to try and gather some of those oversized products back. Um, and working with specifically with Waiuku most recently, they've managed to r get that ball rolling on some of that and um, have been turning this into this, so back into some new product that they can put out there. Um, they're really looking at upscaling on this, so the project is still ongoing at the moment. Um, I caught up with them a couple of weeks ago and they had a whole load of people from CRCs from um, maybe uh, n north of Albany right down to Tauranga. So there are people who are definitely engaged with this and would like to um, get on board, but working out the logistics is, is where they're at at the minute. Um, so there's obviously a lot of plastic waste recovery that can be made there, so that's beneficial to the consumer because they have somewhere to actually take their waste, beneficial to them because they can actually get that reprocessed at the plastics recycling plant that is next door to them and um, save us a bit of money as well. And um, it cuts plastic waste as well, so it's a, it's a good circular route for us. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good everyone. Uh, my name is Max. Uh, excuse me, I am from Australia. Apologies on that one. Uh, um, I represent the circular economy team in Edge Impact, uh, formerly known as Edge Environment, now in Edge Impact. We're a, a global uh, sustainability advisory firm. I've got about a hundred employees around the world. Um, and today I'm, as I said, representing a circular economy team to talk about an issue that we addressed, um, and it is it is furniture, office furniture. Um, anyone who's been involved in an office refit or office, um, I went for one about two years ago where essentially they were changing the tenants, they pulled everything off the wall, furniture and all, they put the lift, lift all the way to the top, they put a big dump truck at the bottom and they just pushed everything in the lift shaft, no matter what it was, in the lift shaft, straight down to the trucks and shipped it out to the landfill. And we know that particularly in the context of uh, office furniture, it's mostly reusable. It's mostly in great condition. It can be reused. This is an exact op opportunity for us to reuse this, find a new home, design out, um, design out waste out of um, our uh, uh, out of this <coughs> out of this particular problem material. And so at Edge, we we love these sort of problems that require uh, total industry engagement, that require government input to coordinate it. Um, and we were lucky enough uh, to be funded by the Australian government in collaboration with Planet Arc and Gecka to develop up and design fit for office scheme which is essentially a product steward scheme a voluntary uh, scheme what we did was uh, first thing we do is we brought everyone together we got all of the biggest product manufacturers office manufacturers in a room 30 of them we said look this is an issue we need to deal with it you need to deal with it um, and so the first thing we discuss is what is the problem here First one was the design of these products. Um, often they aren't modular, so we had to work on de developing some design principles that they needed to implement. We needed to advance recycling opportunities and technologies for problem materials, so laminated timber. How do we deal with this? This is often some of the issue. If it's damaged, how can we give it a new life? Um, we also had to essentially create a secondary market for these products. So we went and we, we worked through these problems because there was no secondary market. Um, we designed the voluntary scheme. Uh, and that first one was a commitment to be part of the scheme and, and to be part of that scheme they had to commit to being a take back, they had to commit to take back which is a big deal. How do we do the take back, where do we know where to take back from, all that stuff, so that was a challenge for them. They also had to commit to funding new technology and we focused particularly on timber laminate and rehoming those um, and being able to uh, essentially find a new home a technology that could essentially create, take that into something like this. Um, and so that was the secondary part, and that was supported by centralised resources. So um, it's, we've since created or and are creating a website that essentially allows these participants to understand where their product is um, and also where there might be a need for a refit, essentially like Tinder for office furniture. We bring that together. Um, it enabled members to, um, <coughs> to provide all the communication and marketing resources needed to demonstrate um, a, or, and find a second home for their product and all the communication uh, and support that was needed. This is the products that we've started focusing already, particularly we focus on uh, chairs, storage cabinets, also workstations, um, all of these things now across pretty much all of the area that we're working in, which is mostly metropolitan Sydney and beyond, um, are going to be rehoused and find new homes. So it's, a, it's an example of a collaborative project where funded by government to bring people together, incentivized, supported by technology, 
um, to use circular economy principles to solve this issue. Awesome. Thanks. Last but not least, so I have the brief of a strong finish. Um, <laughs> it's a big brief. Um, I am CEO and founder of Circularity. We're a circular design and innovation partner, and we are absolutely leaning into how do we design out the big issue for all of us that we're tackling, which is 100 billion tonnes of virgin materials being extracted from the earth every single year. That's our toys, it's our cars, it's our renovation of our homes, it's our clothing. Less than 10% of that is ever circular. So we have, all of us, have a giant game of whack-a-mole with the linear economy to be playing. Um, that is the task at Circularity. Um, I started Circularity, I've given you a bit of colour in case you need a bit of pop at this time <laughs> of, the, of the evening. We are a certified B Corp. The work we do with our clients means that we can become certified and that's the impact that we're delivering, either designing out waste, keeping materials in flow or regenerating living systems. Um, and this is my forever company. I woke up one day and said this is all I want to do, how do I build a company around it? Um, and I'm utterly obsessed with the question of how do we accelerate change? How do we make it move faster? Um, so the work I did at Circularity when we started was building prototypes and tools and methods and ways in which I could get businesses to make these big shifts. Because uh, we know we know what the science says, we know how it works, but action is still not happening and we have that big number to tackle. So we worked with businesses like EcoStore, gave them five years of NPD pipeline, um, but I got a bit hungry for how do I make that horse go faster? Um, and we created the XLab Circular Economy Program. My question for that was how do I put 20 businesses in the room and we do what takes us three years in one week? And that's what became X Labs. We were very lucky to get a bit of funding from MFE. Funding's hard to go around in this space, isn't it? I'm sure we all feel that. Um, to be able to work out what does that look like. If a business like Fletcher Challenge is in the room, how do we shift them? If a business like Rescued Kitchen is in the room, how do we shift them? What can we do to support them in five days? Once we'd cracked that, we're rolling that out. And so I wanted to share a little case study that fell out for that because sometimes it's hard to believe what is possible for some business for five days. But it is about unlocking mindsets as much as developing new designs and new actions. So what we did with Hot House Tomatoes, if anyone knows the growers are sitting out at Pukekohe on the hills out there, they're the ones that had the onions rolling down the pavement during the floods, right? crazy that that is our food bowl out there. Hot House Tomatoes created this incredible innovation. All these strings are made from a very technical plastic material. Uh, there's wires that hold up the tomatoes. They sit in little concrete boxes. Um, and there's clips made of plastic that are clipping the tomatoes. What that means when they go to glean them, if you like, and get them over to the supermarkets for us to enjoy, is all of that plastic is wrapped up in those plants and they can't do anything with it. So they buy the fertilizers in, they buy the chemicals in, and so the circle continues and continues. And 404 tonnes of that beautiful biological material goes to landfill every single year. So in five days we sat down with them, they brought in their growing methods, um, we had them pitch and present, we had our designers work with them, and they created and started investigating solutions that were already available. Bio twine, uh, bio clips that could stay in the tomato vines and actually go and create beautiful compost, and a new kind of clip that meant that they, the growers and the, the gleaners could unhook it as they pulled the tomatoes out. So all of that came out of the waste, and now they're creating beautiful compost, which is going to replace that fertilizer that they've been feeding those tomatoes with. And guess what? I reckon they're going to start tasting better. <laughs> That's my little case study. Um, X Labs continues this year in 2023. Um, we're inviting businesses to come and be part of that food revolution, designing for a circular economy. And the next one we're tackling is cities. And then we're moving on to tourism because we think there's some opportunity for there. So in the interest in what we set up for the purposes of this, open for collaboration and ways in which we can make the economy more circular.